Hey guys, how you doing? So I just want to talk quickly about AI, what's going on now. So first of all, I don't want you to be worried about AI taking all jobs. We're just doing a little bit of transitional thing, bing, 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 get into agentic AI development, and you'll be fine. Trust me. I think also, uh, it's, just, it's just a power tool, right? Once upon a time, plumbers, I don't know, forget about plumbers. I don't know enough about plumbers, but... Um, People cut trees. They cut trees down. They used to do axes. They used to have the axes. So they cut down so many trees per hour. Now they have these people out there with big machines. They go cutting the trees. But there still has to be people doing it because the tree cutting machines don't think. And guess what? The AIs uh, don't think in the way that we think that they think because we don't think either. Let me expand upon this. I am not an AI expert by any means, but I do have three decades of software development experience, number one. And number two, just as importantly, actually, perhaps more importantly, I understand a little bit more about how the brain works than most people because I have a background in psychology. I'm not a psychologist, but that was my major in university. Anyway, what you learned, uh, this guy named Kahneman and his partner, before I forget his, uh, his name. Anyway, this guy, famous guy, won the Nobel Prize, figured out that we have two operating systems in our brain. He called it system one, system two. I call it, uh, other people say lizard brain and cognitive brain. So lizard brain is a super powerful computer between our ears that's been evolved since lizard. And it basically controls our lives. Our, most of our perception of reality is dictated by the lizard brain. It is like infinitely more powerful, not infinitely, but hugely more powerful than our cognitive brain. Most of the time in our daily lives, most of the time, we're actually not thinking in a logical way. What we are doing, and this is where a little software development experience will come in handy, what we are actually doing is just making associations. And once an association is established in our brains, then our emotional cells takes over and we latch on to that. That's why when somebody is very religious or is part of a particular political party, once they become emotionally invested in that, no matter what evidence you present, they will never break away from that. That's just because that's how our brains are designed. There are uh, evolutionary survival reasons why that is the case. Anyway, I won't go down this rabbit hole. Bottom line is most of the time, it's hard for people, people to accept, but if you look at the, you look at the uh, science and you observe things with uh, educated eyes, you see that it's the case. Most of the time, me and you are resolving reality around us based on associations, not based on logic based on associations. Advertising, it works on that premise. A re repetition of the message. The old rule they used to say in advertising was the rule of seven. Seven exposures gets people comfortable with uh, the message, and so all of a sudden it becomes believable. There's no logic to it except for the number of exposures, right? So for example, uh, as a quick example, if you walk across this dog, you're walking down the street, and you see this new dog, you're like, ooh, it's a new dog. I've never seen this dog before. So our default behavior through evolutionary programming is to say, ooh, let's pay attention to that dog. It could bite us. But doesn't, you, go by, you walk by the dog, doesn't bite you, you go, phew, it didn't bite me. Next day you come by, you see the dog again, eh, you're still cautious because you've only seen him once before. But you're a little less freaked out because, you know, history tells you, hey, it didn't bite me last time. You walk by, no problem. So by the time you've seen that dog seven, eight times and he hasn't bitten you, hey, you don't even care about it anymore because your brain goes, you don't have to care because this dog, it, you know, doesn't bite. We've passed by it seven times, it doesn't bite. It's not going to bite us. But who knows? Maybe that dog one day was in a bad mood. And, or maybe he got rabies and he's nuts that day and he'll bite you. You don't know. Or maybe the next day you walk by and you look at it, you see a dog that's pretty much, it looks like the same dog, kind of the same dog. So you go, oh, it's probably safe. And you go by and, and, and you, know, you don't think about uh, other things that might give you indicators of whether or not this dog will bite you or not. We do that a lot. Our brains are constantly trying to save energy. So its um, default is to 
lean back on associative learnings. Basically, if we've encountered things many times, it's been consistent, we just assume it's going gonna, it's gonna to be consistent going forward. It's a pretty good gamble. It's not always uh, effective, but most of the time it is. And our brain works that way. And by the way, so does the AI. So why does our brain work that way? Because to work it out, every time you see that dog, to work it out logically and think to yourself, hmm, is that dog going to bite us? Let's look at a few indicators. Is he, is he growling or is he, is he doing this? Is his tail up or is it down? Blah, 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 blah. Whatever indicators that uh, an educated person might look at to see whether or not a dog is going to bite. Um, we don't do that because it's a waste of energy. Too much brain compute cycles, very energy draining. And you got to remember, for most of human history, uh, energy, food, was intermittent and scarce. So our brains use up a lot of energy to do what it does. And it's saved a lot of, it, it would use these default mechanisms. So system one, the system of association or the giant associative array aspect of our brain is what dominates most of our decision making. System two, which is very new in evolutionary terms, the logical brain, the brain that can actually do math and figure it out and come up with new ideas it's never encountered before, that's, uh, that's a far less evolved, far slower brain, meaning it functions much slower, takes a lot more energy, and so uh, we don't use it nearly as much. In our day-to-day, -day, we don't use it very much. Um, so anyhow... LLMs, learn Large Language Models, AI, as far as I understand, they are basically giant system ones. They don't have logical capacity. They have great capacity in terms of association, much faster than us now. And we know that they don't have logical capacity, at least I think they don't, because whenever uh, some new test comes out that has not been seen before, they fail utterly. Basically, a new type of math uh, test, a new type of test. Apple just did a couple of examples of that. A new type of test they've never been trained on, they've never seen before. If the models had reasoning capabilities like humans, if they had logical capabilities, they would be able to logically reason it out at a decent level. But they usually fail, like they get a 5% or lower success rate in things that they've never seen before. But once they've seen them, uh, they can store it in their database. They can be trained. No, you see this, you do that. You see this, you do that. Association, 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 not logic. So that's it. So the, the LLMs are not logical. They don't have logical capacity. I don't think so anyway. Now, they may seem to have logical capacity to us. It may seem like it to us because we operate on our day-to-day -day basis illogically or without logic would be a better term. That's just our default uh, behavior to save energy, as I mentioned before. It takes great, that's why new creations, new works of art or new works of technology, things that have never been done before are so rare because it's a very difficult thing to do. Recall, recall and uh, pulling up you know, bits of information from, uh, that we've seen before and creating connections and associations, much easier to do. Anyway, so what does this all mean when it comes to coding and software development? It means that... I look at LLMs, I think you should learn how to use the AI, but I look at, the, at them as super powerful IDEs, integrated development environments. They are power tools. You still need to know what you're doing. Now, um, software, you know, a lot of this stuff, software, by the way, is pretty, you know, I've been saying for decade, a couple decades now, most web apps are just capture information in a form, scrub it to make sure the data is clean, Store it in a database, then pull it out of the database at a later date, and and uh, present it to the user in a way that uh, is useful. So you know, capture sales information. Bye bye. Buy this. I buy this. I buy this. This and that. Amazon plus click. Boom, goes in the database, and then it sends us an email, formatting it, telling us, okay, here we go. Some basic business rules are applied to that data. That's most apps. It's some variation of that. Gaming apps are a little bit different. But I can see why now the LOMs can build a lot of apps or they can start building apps because um, if you guide them, because these things are just variants, variations of things we've done before over and over and over again. Something I've been saying about software development for years, it hasn't really changed much since 2015. 
I think that was the last big change in the web stack, at least. Uh, and then everything else is just mild refinements of what we've done. There's been no paradigm shift. The only thing that's changed is uh, DevOps has gotten more sophisticated and the server um, uh, models in terms of scaling uh, has gotten my far more sophisticated. A lot of the stuff that we used to do in uh, apps in terms of scaling, which is, again, as I've said many times, it's, it's very rare these days that you need to be concerned about scaling your app. One in a million, one in, okay, maybe one in 10,000 need to be scaled. You have to be concerned about it. Servers are so powerful. Bandwidth is so big. We all have tons of memory, to, you know, tons of CPU. Um, so the only other thing that's changed is the, the very nice, how sophisticated uh, hosting has become, where you could, you don't have to worry about engineering the scaling uh, architecture into your app. You can just use AWS or Azure or something to do that with a VPS and, you know, as long as you, you, you uh, build two uh, parameters. But beyond that, it's pretty much the same. So it goes to what I was saying before, how AI, meh, you know, it's not really thinking. That's why it's able to code fairly well, because it's not really thinking. Anyway, all of that said and done, I think once this whole thing shakes out, meaning once uh, companies have recalibrated, I think there's going to be a lot of new jobs, because I think LLMs, despite the weaknesses I just described, the fact that they're just system one uh, devices, if you will, system one uh, software. I'm talking about the system one and two in terms of the psychology as defined by Kahneman. I think that's very useful. So use them, use them, use them, learn them. You got to think of the AI and the agents and agentic development. You got to think of it just as we used to think of, oh, a new library or a new programming language or, oh, client side uh, JavaScript libraries now. We're going to leverage these as opposed to doing everything on the server. You know, that's where React comes in, Angular and Vue, et cetera. Same thing. You're going to be far more productive. So I was talking to my brother, who's a highly experienced developer, even more so than me. Uh, yeah, he's, I've dropped off of de active development for a while now because I'm just busy with my businesses, but he still develops. He's an iOS developer primarily, although he doesn't, you know, after you've done development for 10 years, you can, you can touch pretty much anything with a little bit of effort. Anyhow, and he was saying he uses Cloud uh, to, uh, and the agents built, built into Cloud to help him uh, debug Android apps as a recent example. But he still has to guide it, right? It's very powerful. He still has to guide it. But the thing is, the problems that Cloud was um, resolving in this Android app, I'm sure it's happened a thousand times before as some variant. So that's why I was able to, f to figure it out through trial and error. Bing, 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 bing. But my brother, the experienced developer, still had to guide it. And as I've seen, he said it himself, he still, you, you couldn't get a noob to do this. You had to know how to debug. And that's pretty much it. So yeah, um, I hope this video makes sense. I put it out there just to... Uh, put out my thoughts on all this stuff and to encourage you to learn your fundamentals. If you're doing my, you're in my program, you're doing my courses, do my fundamentals, which is the web stack, and then get into building real things and then get into the agentic stuff and learn AI. You got to learn the different AI models out there. Like you would learn different languages or different database types, you know, like with databases, sometimes you want to use an SQL database. Sometimes you want to use a flat file system. Sometimes you want to use a, you know, a no SQL based system, et cetera, and so forth. Same thing with the AI. There will be times when it's superior to use Grok in a particular application or to use GPT in a certain application. Or which model of GPT? Do you use 4.0 or 0 for mini, et cetera, and so on. This is complex stuff. The complexity in agent and AI development, not building the AIs, but implementing them into systems and building systems and building workflows, I think it, it's very complex. And the vast majority of suits won't be able to work with them. And that's where you're, you're going to be a new class of developer that's emerging, the agent developer, and they're going to be in high, high, high demand. Jump into that and, again... For small and for SME, small, medium-sized business, they're still going to be using WordPress. They're going to be still using JavaScript. They're going to still be using CSS web, but it's just going to be sped up, just like using an IDE speeds up the process of development today. 
when, you know, like an idiot, back in the day when I started writing Java commercially, for the first two years, give or take, I refused to use an IDE because I thought A, it was kind of cheating, and B, I thought I would learn more quickly if I would just write hand code inside of Notepad, you know, a simple text editor. Not even a code editor. And so I, for two years, I wrote all my Java code in Notepad. I know it sounds stupid. Anybody who knows development, if, why would you do that? Why don't you use a code editor or an IDE? That was stupid. So I used that for two years, and I would compile in Javac. And then I finally broke down and decided to use an IDE. And my productivity just went whoom. And then I was making a lot more money. I got to be a better coder because the IDE, IDE would guide me in certain things. So uh, these, these uh, large language uh, models, same thing, but on steroids. I'm Uncle Steph. Let me know what you think about this video. Put a comment below. If you like this type of video, let me know in the comments below. Say, I like this type of video. If you don't like my hat, give me a thumbs down. Well, give me two thumbs down. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up. Don't mind. If you don't mind, share it to people. Let me know. My content uh, production is uh, driven by the reaction I get from people. If I get a good reaction, a lot of people liking it, I do more. If I don't get a reaction, I do less. You know? All right. Cheers.